Um, so, but I'm happy to be here. I thought I would talk for, I don't know, uh, 20 minutes or so on some ideas about politics and inclusive pedagogy, and then part of it is to enjoy the conversation. This is a small audience. I'm really excited about this. I could spend a, a, a lot of time talking about my office. The office was created in 2015. It has a bizarrely broad book of business. Some of it deals with investigations. I investigate faculty for race discrimination, Title IX. Uh, reports to me, I guide or coach along, or in the more negative sense, audit all ladder rank faculty hiring, which means that I have to approve all search plans, applicant pool shortlists, approve all waivers to make sure they're on the up and up so that hiring is done appropriately. I have an R&D team called Bruinex that does interesting data analytics and even experiments to counter social identity threat or stereotype threat to help build uh, a more effective uh, teaching environment for all of us. So there's a lot of stuff that uh, we do, uh, and it's been uh, quite a ride for the past four years, which is great in 2015, not easy by any stretch. What I wanted to talk about, and the title was supposed to be about politics and inclusive pedagogy, and the prompt that I was given to address, especially was to focus on what about uh, what might be called the other side, which might be what happens if you're a conservative student uh, and your politics are thus in the minority in higher education generally, maybe you said it specifically. What does it mean to be in the role of a teacher, not necessarily to be in the role of an activist, um, a citizen? a fellow student, but actually to be a teacher when you recognize that there might be someone within um, your student body that feels like an outsider, but for reasons that might not naturally align with your own politics. I don't, I don't want to presume what your politics are by any stretch. I understand what the mobile representation of, uh, say, Democrat versus Republican leading might be for people in the university context faculty. But it's a genuine question. It's a genuine challenge, uh, especially at a time of animosity. So I want to talk about some of these concepts, animosity, uh, neutrality, equality, and maybe share some thoughts on pedagogy. But, um, uh, but you know, as a spoiler alert, yeah, it's not as if I have all the answers. I have very few. Um, but I have some experience. In some ways, I want to start a conversation and hopefully learn as much as I can share. Let me start with the obvious. <clears throat> we live in times of great animosity. Yeah, animosity is really all around us. Whether normally I'm talking to groups that are more sympathetic to left of center anxiety, so obviously white supremacy in Charlottesville. I mean, I, I took this job in 2015, but it was that summer that led that created so much bloodshed that led to Black Lives Matter in the fall. Um, there was also the Me Too movement, right? Uh, there's also the unexpected election of a president that did the very good actually win. There's marches uh, and maybe a green lighting of a particular kind of both obstreperous and extremist politics that that political uh, campaign uh, uh, permitted anonymous trolls on the internet with uh, speakers coming to campuses just to kind of get people riled up so that they can get more likes on Instagram. Um, Israel Palestine. Right. And again, it's hard to understand what those politics, I mean, I guess we could understand what those politics look like on a left-right scale, but it's actually complex. And certainly over the long horizon of, again, anti-Semitism, which I understand to be again, one of the longest prejudices and the longest hatreds that are always around, and yet the weird configuration of politics as understood currently uh, make it such that there's just a lot of animosity and a lot of anger. And these fractures happen not only in terms of value, which we understand, but also in terms of facts. And the values discourse that I see is really important. I mean, there's an invocation constantly, and my politics are clearly left of center, right? There's an invocation of a certain kind of righteousness that involves moral mm -hmm. mandates. And moral mandates are kind of mandates that are supposed to be universal, objectively, and non-controversially true, uh, and, it had, and it's sort of something that I know that cannot be changed by virtue of anyone else telling me Otherwise. And when we have these disagreements about moral mandates, right, what you have is usually a lot of outrage. You even have disgust and contempt for the other group. And right now, what can we talk about in this particular institution at this particular time? It might be, again, a certain majority of one political union versus another. And I'm intentionally trying to be a little bit detached, describing groups A versus B. It's not to always, you know, everyone understands that everyone understands that we do even though so, you know false equivalences, et cetera, et cetera. We can unpack it at multiple levels, but I'm just trying to explain that 
what I see is um, a dissolution of values, and those are uh, those are troubling and challenging times. Nothing you don't already know. I mean, worse, we also have that with facts, and if not facts, the way to resolve contested questions of fact, and you can decide where that came from and whether some responsibility uh, actually falls on you know the postmodern term, which was quite sexy in the university to try to contest conceptions of empiricism, that it's exceptionalism that we gave to scientific uh, procedures and methods of knowing the world, and have all kinds of contradictions, or it could be more a more recent phenomenon. But we no longer seem to be able to answer contested questions of fact, like, is the world warming? Uh, is that because of human beings and fossil fuels? I mean, Maybe you think it's obvious. Maybe other people, but you know, the contestation of how we even resolve questions of fact uh, put us in an especially dangerous bind. And so, whether you like Yates, whether you like Rawls, uh, the center cannot hold. And I don't think, to use John Rawls's uh, terminology, increasingly there's less and less of an overlapping political consensus to do our work and as just citizens, but also as educators, and the university cannot be here. So all of this you already know, but I just wanted to say that the animosity is real. We would be foolish to think that all the conflict out there, globally, nationally, globally, would not have manifestations locally. Of course it does. If you don't think that, again, racial profiling happens, if you think racial profiling happens out there, but not in our own house, of course it does. We own apartments. We're essentially a small city state. If you think that sexual harassment happens out there, well, no, everyone realizes it also happens here. But the point is, all the things that are bad out there, of course, must manifest themselves here. Because you have to appreciate UCLA essentially, and this is something that I completely did not understand until I became an administrator. UCLA is essentially a city state. At any given time, there might be 70 to 80,000 people on the grounds. And it's just a bizarre city state where power flows and interesting ways. It's about, not necessarily about votes, but it's about, again, certain kinds of currencies of academic power, currencies of students to be able to take over the university buildings, labor, regents, donors, athletics. There's a whole interesting configuration of constituencies and, you know, just constituents of this republic of UCLA. And the division of powers, both horizontally and vertically, in the city-state is just fascinating. But just as every city must feel it in the nation and in the world, UCLA feels it. So we're not exceptional in that way. So animosity. The second thing I want to talk a little bit about is then oftentimes a turn to neutrality. It's not always the case as educators. So I'm going to share a little bit of a story as an administrator, but also I think our impulses as educators. So when you know lots of people are fighting, Right, especially if you're an administrator, there's a natural impulse to go in and be a neutral umpire. Our embrace of neutrality comes from multiple sources. I'm a lawyer by training, and some of it comes from legal traditions, including, again, the way that we adore the First Amendment. I, I understand that we can critique it, but the First Amendment and this idea of freedom of expression, which then conflates to this sense of academic freedom, which we use all the time but rarely can define uh, or even unpack. Uh, in, in deeply, un, uh, it's frankly anti-intellectual how poorly we understand these concepts generally, even though they're part of our self-conception as academics. But because there is this important commitment, the idea that the state, uh, it says Congress, this is the literal wording of the First Amendment, but the idea that acting as an agent of the government or state, that we can't suppress speech because of its content, puts us in a position where we feel like we need to be Right? So, because I'm actually, I'm no different than working for the DMV. I'm a state employee in some sense. That's who I am. I am a state employee. I'm a highly paid state employee. I've got various, you know, titles, but I'm a state employee. And if I exercise power to shut some people up and not others, there's an anxiety. Well, maybe I'm picking sides. Maybe I can't do that. Suppress speech based on content. There's a legal reason why we want to try to be neutral. And there's other reasons, including political and pedagogical. Politically, um, in some sense, it is just the standard um, 
I was about to say trap. I, I guess it is this trap. It's a standard trap of liberalism, right? Right. The political theory of liberalism recognizes that we live in a pluralistic society with very different gods, uh, very different values, and given the fact that we believe in different gods, we have different values who don't want to kill each other, we think, well, we should just accept the heterogeneity, indeed celebrate the diversity, and create in some ways very technical and procedural ways to resolve conflict, but then never pick sides about what's good, what's bad, what's true, what's false, what the right God is versus the false God. Because when we used to do that, we would kill each other. So that's the <laughs> lesson of liberalism. Finally, there is this kind of pedagogical thing that gnaws at the back of us. And this is, I think, really interesting. Truly critical thinkers, and I think many of us think, especially when we're teaching undergrads, that this is at bottom the only thing that matters. I mean, maybe communication, uh, writing, and other stuff, right? Because it does, if it's all locked up in your head, it, it, it doesn't help that much. Um, but it's just to convey uh, the ability to be a critical thinker and to actually turn that lens upon yourself so that you could actually be self-critical, uh, so that you could actually analyze other things, but then be able to turn that mirror upon yourself, take a deep breath and see, oh, yeah, me too, right, in a particular kind of way. And when you do that in a really honest way, you realize, man, I was just so wrong. And so when you think about your transition uh, into, uh, you know, into greater and greater forms of, I was about to say adulthood, but it's just intellectual maturity. If you can't recall a time, maybe it was one year ago, five years ago, certainly 15 years ago, if you can't recall a single time where you were just embarrassingly wrong about stuff, then there's a real challenge on whether or not you've been sufficiently self-critical. Like, I've been catastrophically wrong about lots of things, uh, and understudied and just stupid and naive. <laughs> and if you can't recognize that ever, like, we failed as teachers, you're probably an annoying spouse. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's wrong with you. You can't really recognize that. And I guess if you really internalize that virtue and recognize that you might be wrong, then even as you engage these uh, uh, sort of acrimonious de debates, even if you clearly think one side is good and one side is bad, or one side has the right God and the other side has the false God, a little part of you, because you have a a little part of you should say, like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. And that also then requires us pedagogically to embrace a certain kind of neutrality. Now, on the one hand, this is true, and this is going to be a little odder because I'm talking about engagements of what I think to be a modally liberal faculty in the problem space of dealing with conservative students. Um, but even if it's the standard problem of how liberal faculty deal with liberal students, I want to make very clear that this natural impulse to neutrality is just wrong. I mean, it can't be that we're actually neutral. Um, we can't actually be neutral. Think about how we admit people, how we decide what to publish, whom we get advanced tenure. Every time you grade an essay, you're not being neutral. Like, this is a big, this lacks alliteration. I'm making choices. I like consonants that repeat, apparently. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, there are all kinds of choices on quality that you're making. And again, just the way that every discipline has uh, views about originality, about creativity. We're not at all neutral uh, in any sense. Even legally, just the fact, just something that, again, as a lawyer, I wanted to really emphasize. You should know that it is true that sometimes when you're acting as an agent of the state, and oftentimes I do act as an agent of the state, if I try to shut certain people off, I am suppressing their speech, and that triggers first moment. Society. That said, when I'm speaking, which is what I'm doing right now, I don't have to be shy as a speaker to express my own values and my own facts. The usual joke I give is, look, I am the vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion. I am not the minister of inequity, homogeneity, and exclusion. Each word, equity versus inequity, diversity versus homogeneity, inclusion versus exclusion, those are all choices. Those are, in some sense, radical choices that we are making and funding and actually expressing. I feel not at all timid, not at all shy in breaking neutrality, embracing equity, diversity, inclusion over the other values. 
And that's something I can do because that's how I speak. And I have the right to speak, even as a government agent, even if I'm not suppressing the speech of others. Also, politically, there's not neutrality that way all the time. Although it raises this hard question that all of you must thought. Must our embrace of diversity and heterogeneity also embrace of those who reject diversity? So again, let's put a fine point on it. If the problem that was presented was, if you're a liberal professor, if most of the students are liberal, but you have some conservative students who may or may not be out in the conversation, and you know that they're actually extremists in that way, at the level of like, you don't deserve to be here, like uh, at, the, at the level of like, you're an immigrant, you took one of my spaces, you're a racial minority, you are part of the group that's undermining what used to be great about America, you just don't deserve to be here, right? If that's the view, and it's sincerely held, of course, just like, you know, you have to ask yourself, does our embrace of, again, diversity of views require us to accept the view that actually rejects the very diversity that makes you second guess yourself before you shut down that perspective. Similarly, pedagogically, does self-critical humility require us to accept world views that reject evidence-based arguments, right? This is not only for the right, I want to underscore. It is also on the left. As you get very, very passionate, uh, as again, and I don't want to overly exaggerate the difference between path and love those, but as you get very, very angry about something that's uh, that's deeply unjust, uh, whether or on your conception of the left or the right, it's very hard to actually take arguments, and you might actually find yourself in a place where, frankly, you're not listening to any arguments, evidence-based or otherwise, and does our own humility, the recognition that we might be wrong, Require, require us to countenance the views of others uh, that clearly don't uh, have any affordances or the possibility of viewing uh, that they may be wrong. I think those are the questions about neutrality that are both um, uh, challenging, but also I wanted to explore why it's inviting. So again, just to repeat, we live in a tough world right now, and of course it's reflected at UCLA. The standard response is just to be neutral. Imagine you're a physics professor or imagine you're a tax professor, or imagine you're doing basic statistics, or imagine you're just doing, you know, American history maybe, or maybe an ancient history, uh, you know, of a civilization long past. It's very natural for you to think, oh, the easiest way for me to do this is in some ways to be neutral. And I'm suggesting on the one hand, I understand that. On the other hand, we are always making choices. It's important to understand what kinds of choices we make and why. The third point that I want to talk about is a little bit about equality. And again, this all took will be uh, obvious. Within the university, equality is threatened by the animosity that I talked about. There is abuse of power. It could be physical power, economic, cultural, social. And again, just on the facts. And just depending on the threat environment, it's actually different power carries different kinds of weight. Uh, it might not even be animosity, but the abuse of power that faculty inflict on graduate students, that inflict on other students, potentially, in the context of sexual harassment, or just exploitation, or just maybe almost academic misconduct, right? taking credit where they should not, or just profound disrespect about the fact that people lower on some academic status quo ought to actually have lives as well, and they are not your lackeys because they have lower credentials. Again, maybe this is entirely alien in your departments and you've never seen such things in your histories. Trust me, this kind of hierarchy of the use of power, I think, is common in various forms of uh, higher education and life. It could be that kind of power, but sometimes it could be just, again, social power. And this is where it's awkward because the general distribution of social power in society might cut in one direction, but talking about niches, environments, specific city-states. So again, to be in Los Angeles means something. To be in UCLA means something. To be in higher education means something. And maybe that seems to be the source of a resistance to a larger distribution of power, both 
historically and nationally, that seems to be a relatively small resistance, according to a much larger and unfair game that has existed for centuries. But then, if you actually narrow it down still further, you could find some people who, like, I, you know, let's pick something that shouldn't be overly controversial, but let's suppose someone who is very, very, very conservatively Judeo-Christian and finds uh, his or her values to be largely, largely, like, alien to the students around them, either in terms of drinking culture, partying culture, sexual mores, a certain kind of sarcasm and, uh, uh, and a willingness to joke about religion and about other things, a certain kind of disrespect on the relationship between, um, you know, sort of you know, purity and, I don't know, uh, anything that is uh, stigmatized or tainted. And you can have extensions to sexual orientation, you can have extensions toward you know, national politics and geopolitics generally. Even if they are in much more a majority from a nationwide evaluation, all politics are local, all social mores and powers are local. And so even though, again, I refuse the easy claim that long-standing structural distributions of power determine who can or cannot actually misuse power in any given point. Power is very micro-localized as well. Of course, we have to see the big picture of the history, but at any given moment, any two human beings, they can wreak power on each other in ways that are incredibly damaging and powerful. And, uh, and I have to just say, it, this outrages people uh, to whom that... Uh, to whom I often speak, uh, I recognize the social power that could actually be inflicted on a conservative student in the context of an immigration conversation where he doesn't even know how to have the conversation when he thinks, well, we do need borders. Um, we do need lawful borders. I'm not defending the current set that we see, but how do I even have that conversation if that's being immediately shut down as representation of either um, cruelty towards people here um, or an insensitivity. Uh, I think those are real. Uh, and again, I just want to confess that that creates, most people think that's outrageous that uh, someone who does a chief diversity officer would even grant that publicly. Why, of all the problems I have to worry about, why would you even say that publicly? You know it's going to be weaponized and you use a comment video by someone else to say that something else. But, you know, I'm also fundamentally a human being. About what it means to speak honestly. Also on neutrality, I just want to try to emphasize, I guess the flip side is not to suggest that formal neutrality uh, is what uh, is what solves the day. I mean, even though I recognize heterogeneity for us to say formally, oh well, you can say that, you can say that, everyone can say everything. I mean, did we blind to context as degenerate inequality? And we can talk about different unpack different theories of equality, but I just want to emphasize that even though we have this kind of anything goes context that comes from freedom of expression, we also have other constitutional equipment of commitments that really focus on equal protection under the laws. And in a university context, part of what I'm just trying to do is how do we build equity for all? So for students, what I'm really just trying to do is can I build a platform can I make UCLA a platform that lots of different people, especially people with very low opportunities outside of the university can come to, and they can use that platform to accelerate and hit an extraordinary kind of escape velocity that they can be their very best, and they can also pull up the communities they care so much about as they, get, as they, as they use UCLA uh, almost as an accelerant in this particular kind of way. But you have to recognize that different people have different access to the platform. More importantly, even if they get on to the platform, different people have different kinds of boosters that are invisible, and different people have different kinds of headwinds that are invisible. And those are oftentimes not a function of the individual herself, but a function of the context in which that individual marinates. And so to the simple fact that being radically underrepresented in terms of your social group within a particular community makes it all the more likely that you will do worse and actually underperform your incoming credentials. And so the evidence of both stereotype threat and social identity threat is well established. You can 
actually give decent quantification probabilistically of how it might affect people. But the goal is to create an equal platform, and equal platforms to allow everyone to get to UCLA and then accelerate require actually not formalistic identical treatment of all, but a nuanced understanding of where different communities are. So the fact that, again, if African Americans are underrepresented in a particular context, whether it be the entire university, whether it be in a particular department, whether it be, again, in a particular class, their ability to actually succeed is actually hindered, not because of their individual capacities, but because of that rank of representation and the set of stereotypes associated with African Americans within a university uh, context and culture. It could happen in different kinds of ways to all different kinds of groups, and I want to emphasize that. But whether it does or it doesn't is an, is an empirical question, and part of that empiric should drive how we build the empirical environment. I've gone on a great length. Let me give you one more point, and then I'll stop for a conversation. And it's really about then what do we do about pedagogy. So I've outlined to you, again, things you know. Rank animosity, why neutrality is tempting, but it can entirely be right. Why equality in the classroom, right, which is not formal identical treatment, an idea that look, everyone should have an equal shot at success within the classroom experience, within the department experience, within the university experience, to actually uh, succeed through UCLA. That's the goal. What can we do? There are a couple of things that I want to just suggest, and, and I've been going on too long, so I'll do this in a, an abbreviated way. One is to really, uh, I want to suggest to remind ourselves as well as students that intelligence is a virtue. Intelligence is a virtue. I don't mean social justice only being a virtue. I mean intelligence being a virtue. For whatever sets of reasons the students we have and the colleagues we have uh, are actually intelligent. It's, well, I don't really care whether you think they were born with it because of hustle, despite their laziness, whatever it is. People actually have minds. And I think we have an ethical obligation not to lose our minds. And I think that's what the university has to require of us. If conflict and acrimony manifest themselves here no differently than they do on the public square, on cable news channels, everywhere else within civil society, Deeply lost, right? We've lost a deeply important opportunity to actually demonstrate that those conflicts and those conversations can happen differently here in the university, where the fact that you have a mind actually does matter. And one of the core important ideas about having a mind is, in my view, to recognize that you might be wrong. And I think if students don't ever with the possibility that they might be wrong, even on moral mandates, I think, again, we have done that a great disservice. So I think part of the challenge of dealing with, again, minority viewpoints in whatever ways, again, the hardest, uh, I think, to talk about right now is, again, if you happen to be a left of center professor, most of your students happen to be left of center, uh, but you have some students who are right of center, and they go there. And sometimes they go there obstreperously because those are their moral methods. Uh, and they want to make the university great again. Uh, and they want to stake out their claims that we don't have to deal with this nonsense. How do you actually deal with that moment? And part of the ground rules of engagement has to be that you pour in enough such that students recognize, again, that they might be wrong education is to inculcate that as an ethical virtue. It's abstract, but I want to throw that out there. Connected with this is just this whole point about self-analysis and the ability to actually see why we're so deeply motivated to think that we're always right. I don't want to talk about values, I want to talk about facts. There's this great study that was done back in 1954 that I call, you know, it's called They Saw a Game. And it was this great study that talked about um, the outrage between uh, outrage between football teams, Princeton and Dartmouth, I believe, gave me, but the point is Princeton and Dartmouth having a game and then people just going crazy at each other's side. I think they're all men, they're all I think, uh, mostly white. So you know, it, but they were crazy angry at, at each side back in the fifties. They each accused the other of playing a, a horribly dirty game, dirty game, one of the quarterbacks. I think broke his 
leg. The journalistic accounts were one side versus the other. Here are some of the motivated uh, perceptions, right? And this is language from the article itself. It was written by actually two psychologists that are written in Princeton just to see what's going on. The Princeton fans saw a continuing saga of Dartmouth atrocities and occasional Princeton retaliations. The Dartmouth fans saw brutal Princeton provocations and occasional measured Dartmouth responses. <laughs> so pick Israel versus Palestine, pick, you know, I don't know, Black Lives Matter versus what all lives matter, pick whatever conflicts, pick like, you know, uh, I don't know what campus is talking whatever you want. I, uh, uh, and uh, it was so stunning that when the Dartmouth group uh, there was an alum group in the Midwest. They insisted on getting a video of the game. Like, there was no internet back then. They literally had to get the reel because they wanted to show it to the alums. And so they get it, and the Dartmouth alum group, like, they look at it because they had heard it through their newsletters about how awful the Princeton students were. And um, literally, they write back, uh, and this is through a telegram. Preview of Princeton movie indicates considerable cutting of important part. Please wire explanation and possibly airmail missing part before showing schedule. We have splicing equipment. So they had heard about all these atrocities. And then when they saw it, it's like, what? Like, they, it's like they must have edited it. In. And they're calling back. It's like a deep fake. So they're calling back saying, oh, no, you didn't send us everything. Please send it to us because we're sending it to our loves. And they're waiting for red meat. Uh, and it's just a this is in the 50s, amplify that with everything that happens in social media, and it's just this motivated reason that is so profound and so deep, both on our values, which are to be, are givens, right? Like, you have your God, or you have my God, and I use God with a lower G, like, God could be anything, like, oh, capitalism, so whatever, you know? Uh, we're sufficiently sophisticated that we can be playful that way on both. But we rationalize our side, not only about values, but also about facts. We dismiss the other side so easily. And I think that's a challenge because I, I guess I'll just say I have very strong political commitments. I, you know, I'm an immigrant, I'm a first gen, I received a, like, a Pell Grant. I mean, not to be, you know, I have very strong views about, and I, I love the United States because I'm an immigrant, and most immigrants, you know, where if it turns out well, you love the country for giving you extraordinary opportunities. Um, and uh, and I'm I, and I'm and I'm and, and 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 what I adore so much about uh, not American ex exceptionalism as a description, but as an ideal, is really this possibility that we could build a platform that helps us all, that build allows us to accelerate to our very best. Um, I have these really deep commitments about what it means to create that environment, and when I run into people who want to just or battery acid on that, or just tear it down, I get very angry and I get indignant, right, when people express sometimes very explicitly, but more often much more implicitly subtle, a kind of nostalgia for a time when the life was better, when it was easier, when, it, when, when, when you know, when, again, and I understand the excesses, but when older, typically male, uh, and white professors didn't feel like, oh, I have to leave the, you know, the office hours door uh, always open, and you know, I can't, you know, mentor any female students because they're going to say I sexually harass them. At which point, I'm like, really, that's like that's the most profound lesson you got uh, that you, you can't mentor female students anymore. Um, and you know, it's not just faculty. I mean, law partners see this. I see you know, other kinds of things. Uh, a part of me gets really angry. Um, but again, I, because of the virtue of having a brain, I also have to try to meet them a little bit that way. Like I need to understand, and as I get experience, I understand that why that is. And again, life is really unpleasant and messy. And if you saw half the things I saw in the space of equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, your eyes would pop open, your jaw would drop in all kinds of ways. Where bad deeds everywhere happen in ways that I think would be shocking. I want to just conclude, because now I've gone way too long. Um, um, and this is going to sound so weirdly 
milk toast uh, about why I want the muscular noodle. And again, a CDO shouldn't be out there asking for uh, the possibility we could listen to each other, but I actually want to strengthen the muscular noodle. Uh, and the muscular noodle, for me, uh, within this particular context, are people who recognize the value and the importance of, again, self-criticism. Uh, and recognizing the possibility that they might be wrong. We are uh, putting together, one of the things that I do is put together programming. We do it under a cross uh live platform, and we're uh, collaborating with uh, PEN America, an important um, writing uh, institution, uh, an element of civil society that we care about. It's going to be on April 23rd. It's on our website. I encourage you uh, to think about coming to talk about the freedom to protest and the freedom to speak. You'll have teams, you'll have police chiefs, you'll have administrators uh, having that conversation where uh, lots of different moderators will have read us with questions and I'll be on that panel. But I'm going to conclude with the importance of uh, courage, uh, and that's both teaching and at that as students, and something that we don't necessarily talk about. But in my job, in part because of one investigation that I had to actually protect, these were the posters that were actually put about uh, on campus. It says, Vice Chancellor, Advocate of Campus Terror Support because of an investigation that one of my independent unions did. So this happened to Israel versus Palestine. I had to do what I needed to do to call it straight, regardless of what this investigation looks like in one of a series of investigations that I do over the course of the year. This is the response. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you what that means for acrimony, what it means for, again, for all of us to, to try to be courageous. I have tenure. Tenure is a sinecure that should not exist in the modern day world. It doesn't make any economic sense. There's a huge cost to it. Trust me on this one. There's a huge cost to it. We usually wrap ourselves around in grandiloquent justifications about how we need it in order to engage that one hard thought that people have formed for us when it's oftentimes excused just for ignorance and lack of engagement. Uh, but sometimes it is important. And given the fact that I have the shield of tenure, if I can't do what I need to do, even with this, right, and people coming after my family uh, and all kinds of ways, children, you know, a child, I mean, like, yeah, it, it raises interesting questions. Um, I, I wanted to show, show you just one piece of fan mail. Um, whenever you get letters that look like this, you know, you're always looking, okay, is there a powder involved? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just deeply confusing because this is what I get. I should have given you a trigger warning, not a happy face. Uh, but it's, like, how do you understand this? You're in the running for the coveted Adolf Hitler free speech prize. I don't, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure who's upset with me, but someone is clearly upset with me. <laughs> now, on the one hand, you can consider that comical, and it is comical. And, um, on the other hand, I have actually received threats severe enough that I had to go to the police to make sure that they do their own checks uh, for talking about degree diversity and inclusion, which seems odd. And there are actually examples of, again, uh, teachers. And the last time I talked uh, to Epic was giving a keynote last year, and it was only two weeks after uh, horrible shootings, school shootings, where uh, you know teachers go in and actually you know, sacrifice their lives students, they're teaching as if, uh, as if they're locked in that lock, which is the case. And I wanted to just pull back and try to figure out what is noble about what we do at a time where there's so much acrimony and so much uh, sarcasm and hatred. And part of the nobility, uh, part of the nobility of, I think, the teaching practice, of the art of teaching, is to... Um, is to show a certain kind of courage, uh, almost like parenting, but to show a certain kind of courage uh, that allows yourself uh, to be humble enough to recognize that you might be wrong, but also to find a place where students who might be in a moment of contestation and anger and screaming moral mandates at each other that are going to try to break where you can nevertheless intervene with courage um, to try to get each side to understand
understand the possibility that they might be wrong. And if you model that in your, frankly, in your first handshakes, in your first syllables, in the way you listen to questions and respond, even if you're authoritative in response, but to actually unpack the best in the engagements so that you could learn as well as they can learn, that sets up the kind of the trust necessary within the classroom builds up the affordances that allow people maybe to get beyond that initial moment of contestation to a place of greater learning. Yeah. I've gone on too long, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to take uh, questions or conversations. You know. And you, you can call. Um, one of the problems is, uh, like you refer to left of center or whatever. So this is center, a uh, defined center, and so hence, left of center is not defined, and hence, you know, what is, let's say, a conservative opinion is not defined. Also, the second part to this, and the center keeps moving, right? To the right. Well, so, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the second part to this is people don't belong in one place either. So um, I may assume, actually, I, I might even uh, question whether this university is really left of center or yeah, not, yeah, right? Yeah, so for people yeah. like me, uh, I, I may not see enough evidence of that. And I might actually think that over the years, propaganda um, driven sure. slogans are that universities are left of center, but that may not be true. The third thing is no one belongs in one space. So on some issues, we may, you know, whatever our definition might be of center or left of center, but on certain other issues, they are way right of center or whatever. So people can be a mix uh, of opinions, backgrounds, or perspectives and all, right? And um, I'm sorry to push this point one further, is interestingly, someone who is on opposite uh, spectrum on on an issue, it's the issue which might be common. Meaning that um, I was talking to a very, very um, extreme right-wing uh, colleague, and you know, we were talking about. I was saying that I didn't like Obamacare, and you know, this is not good enough, and it's a boom for the insurance industry, blah blah blah, you know. And she was saying roughly the same thing that. Oh, we gotta get rid of Obamacare. <laughs> so it, the issue was the same, except we were coming from totally uh, different uh, points. We actually yeah. found a meeting ground, right? So sometimes if we go through certain uh, common issues, then there is a better chance of dialogue or addressing it. In which case, both of us were slightly more open to listening to why the other person wanted to, you know, get rid of Obamacare, right? Uh, even though we came from, we probably have very different solutions in mind or whatever, or goals or whatever. Um, I will stop there. And, yeah, uh, so hey, so I loved all your comments, and largely I want to agree with them. Uh, and I, you know, I, these are not your words, these are my, uh, this is what fires me. Listen to you, um, uh, and I totally want to agree. There is no uh, clean definition of center, left, right. Those are clearly uh, culturally contingent, historically specific, in transition. Uh, I think if you just define a Democrat versus Republican, you can get actual, but that would be a poor definition in all kinds of ways. And if you actually look at self descriptions, uh, there's a huge amount of faculty who view themselves quite moderate and not uh, extreme forms of one. So I agree with you on that. I think the challenge then is, this is why I use the scare quotes on conservative center or 
left, uh, if there are better terminology, because obviously the words we use do re-cement a particular set of categories, I'm happy to always think about them, uh, but I want to totally agree with your point. And I also want to agree that, again, you could be religiously quite conservative and economically quite liberal and all their implications. I can't tell you how many people, like, you know, again, or as much as ask and say hard things, right? So there are plenty of white women who are down with, again, the Me Too project, uh, totally concerned about gender discrimination, all these kinds of stuff. Seems, to my eye, totally tone deaf uh, of uh, race issues. Flip it, right? Like lots of, you know, uh, men and women, arguably, racial minorities that kind of like, well, that's not that important. Why are you making them out? Why are you stealing my thunder uh, in some sense? And I understand all of that. And so I want to own that kind of Complexity. I'm interested in this, right? I'm, I, I'm joking that I'm so left I end up on the right, or I'm so right that I end up on the left. <laughs> Sometimes it actually happens. It definitely happens in weird ways. But I do think, and I want to hear more thoughts about this, right? What I call the possibility of accidental commonalities. The danger. So this is connected with both, um, I think it's connected with urban design. It's also connected with, um, again, the the environmental design of uh, communication practices. So what I mean by urban design is, everyone says in LA, everyone's in a car, so you're not actually like on a New York subway. So in LA, if you drive two miles in a direction, you end up in a very different environment. On a New York subway, it's like two inches in any environment, and you'll, you'll see you run into a lot of different kinds of uh, folks. But the architecture of transportation, whether you're in a car or a subway or walking, alters the possibility of finding accidentally something that you didn't know that you wanted or liked. So it could be the smell of food, it could be the sound of something or whatnot. And so I am at bottom a deep integrationist. What I mean by that is I actually like integration because what that allows for is the discovery of accidental commonalities which drive new in-groups. And I think of that uh, in all kinds of ways about designing the university in the proper way. Again, I, I have to unpack this in great detail. But the story that you gave, because you both happen to think lowly of Obamacare, it could be that you both love, like you can't like in Game of Thrones season eight, like when does Sunday come? Like you might think like, yes, Stark, you know, how Stark, of course, yes. I mean, you too, yeah. And so it might be that that commonality drives something. I think that's a splendid and beautiful because that's how we get potentially overlapping political consensus, to use the discourse of social psychology, it's very natural for us to create in groups and out groups. Like, you know, I could, in a, just an easy experiment, I can say, uh, like, pick which paintings you like and lie to you and say, oh, you like Kandinsky's, you like Cleese. They look the same if you're not an expert. A Kandinsky, Klee, I can't tell. But once I tell you, just by lying to you randomly, saying, oh, you're the group that prefers Kandinsky's, you're the group that prefers Cleese. Immediately after I create that identity, when I play games, you're willing to help your in-group more than the other in-group in all kinds of ways, even though it's completely manufactured. So the idea that we could find new in-groups, including superordinate in-groups that are larger than us, so that you might, you and I might be different because of gender or because of first language. My first language is actually Korean. We might be different that way, but we might have a superordinate identity about, I don't know, being a teacher or being a Bruin trying to create superordinate identities. A concentric series of concentric or intersecting circles where the largest circle includes all of us that actually driven by some commonalities is an important challenge. So, uh, so I, uh, I agree with your points. I think this possibility of trying to keep, create unexpected connections is I think really an important part of effective community building, which is partly what we do, at least indirectly, in teaching. But I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about how you can accidentally create or discover uh, common in-groups, especially when we tend to uh, self-select out in our, uh, especially our, in our electronic communities. Yeah. Yeah, it's been harder this time with Trump for me than any other. I mean, and I've been teaching since 1892. Um, so I've been through that. I think the only way I can do it sometimes is to say, like with climate change, I often say, God, I wish you were right. I really <laughs> wish that this wasn't true, that it was all scientific hopes uh, in order to destroy big business. You know, I, I, but I found it really hard in the, since this has come about, because it's so antithetical. 
everything that I did, not just what I believe in, but what the facts are saying, what the information is giving us on, on so many different issues, that I, I don't, I'm having a harder time connecting with students on that level. Not that any of them really have very few that are supportive, but. And what do you, can I ask what you teach? Right. Writing. Writing programs. It'd be interesting if you're teaching physics or something or climate. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do teach the one of our assignments yeah. is about the environment, and we start off by basically saying that we're not going to argue whether climate change is real or not, or whether it's man made. That's just not in dispute. You know, um, I really want to believe it's not. I also want to believe when I fly over the North Pole and we see Santa's magic castle or something, but yeah. just when you don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, but depends on what I'm saying. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but, I mean, but you know, um, I mean, in part because you know, uh, I realize I, I don't think it, I mean there is filming that's for me. I think the filming is supposed to stop. Or yeah. You should oh, yeah. 